Folks, thanks for coming along tonight for our section, second function in a row. And Ben and Ben Teller Blue makes a welcome third appearance at the Sydney Institute. He spoke for us when we were at 41 Phillip Street. He spoke for us when we were at level 40 Governor Phillip Tower. And he's speaking for us at 47 Phillip Street. So um, he's well known to our, to our members. But I'll introduce him briefly as the senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies in Washington, D.C., and he's an author of um, Arsenal, Assessing the Republic of, um, of um, Iran's Ballistic Missile Potential. Uh, program. program. Sorry, Domestic Missile Program. And tonight's topic is the Iran-Israel war comes out of the shadows. Benham, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be back at the Sydney Institute. And uh, welcome and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We used to have to import barbed wire. That's a line Iran's supreme leader, and a title meant to be taken rather literally, uh, has said often, has said on video, has said in speeches, and has said from the Friday prayer lectern. The point is, that during the foundational conflict of the 45-year Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, the eight-year war with neighboring Ba'athist Saddam Hussein's Iraq, a conflict which anybody who's anybody in the Islamic Republic today has cut their teeth in, has served, uh, including the current supreme leader, including the new president, uh, Mr. Pazishkian, uh, is a conflict like World War I, World War II, and Vietnam for America, where I come from. And in that conflict, if they were importing barbed wire, as the current Supreme Leader alleges, it shows you a bit about the lack of a domestic arms potential. But fast forward in those same speeches by Iran's Supreme Leader, fast forward in those same videos by Iran's Supreme Leader, where he's talking about four plus decades ago having to import barbed wire. And today, for almost a decade and a half now, the US intelligence community assesses that the Islamic Republic of Iran is home to the largest ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East. What a change. A ballistic missile arsenal which was used historically, overtly, and directly uh, to move that country from the shadow war, from the 45-year proxy war it has prosecuted uh, against Israel and against U.S. forces and against U.S. partners in the region, and on April 13th and April 14th of this year, uh, to be fired uh, at the Jewish state. Of the about 300-plus projectiles that back in April the Islamic Republic of Iran fired, 100 of them were medium-range ballistic missiles, all of them classified uh, as being able to carry an unconventional payload. Hint, hint, that's a nuclear weapon. Now we're again on the precipice where the Islamic Republic is dangling the threat of again overtly, directly, and militarily using this weapon, ballistic missiles, uh, to adjudicate another element of its conflict with Israel. It's claiming to be seeking bloodlust. That was a word cascading for the first week of August across the Iranian press, particularly the hardline press. Uh, as what the regime wanted in response to the killing of Ismail Haniyeh, uh, the Hamas political chief who was guarded by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Tehran. Based on New York Times and Axios reports, this individual was killed by a pre-planted bomb, a bomb that was planted about five and a half weeks before the individual had even arrived. Since October 7th, uh, Haniyeh had twice come to Tehran, once we believe in late October, early November, uh, and once we believe much more recently uh, in the spring of 2024. Either way, it tells you a huge story about how punctured Iran's security state is, but you don't have to take that sense of puncturing from me. You can take it from a former intelligence minister who in 2021 said no official in the Islamic Republic should be sleeping safely at night. Uh, he said that in a larger speech talking about alleged Mossad penetration uh, of Iran's security services. This obviously follows a whole history of the Israel-Iran shadow war that includes cyber attacks, kinetic actions like uh, sabotage from drones, as well as a whole host of uh, assassinations, including of military officials and of nuclear scientists on Iranian soil. But despite this history, despite the mismatched balance uh, between Iran and Israel in the conventional space, meaning that Israel 
classic army, conventional superiority, the Islamic Republic of Iran, asymmetric superiority, gray zone fighter. In all of those instances that we had seen in the alleged Israel-Iran shadow war in the past four and a half decades, Tehran did not feel comfortable moving to the overt threshold, at least not that publicly that we saw back in April. Uh, indeed, one of the policies of this regime was strategic patience to absorb uh, much of this shadow war for fear of trying to respond and save face, but in so doing, lose its head. What has changed right now and what we're living with is the result of two distinct factors, one political and one technical. That is basically allowing the regime to feel comfortable moving from the shadows again and out into the public, making a matter of a potential military response to the killing of Ismail Haniya more a matter of when rather than if, and to include how and where as well. If you look at the hardline media, again, in the first week, week and a half, they are talking about a 360 degree attack vector against the Israelis, potentially trying to have other proxies join in on a fight potentially from Lebanon in the north, potentially from the Houthis in the south in Yemen, potentially from the Shia militias in Iraq and Syria that are to Israel's east. Uh, since October 7, as many of you know, these uh, have been aerial threats that the Israelis has, fa has faced off before, uh, perhaps not as well coordinated, uh, but this is a threat that the Islamic Republic is dangling. And yet we are now, I think, 21 or 22 days, depending on your time zone, uh, since that killing yet no overt attack. Why? That gets us to the political element, which is something bolstering the regime's confidence. Usually if you move from the shadows and you throw a punch and you land a punch, well, you might be also confident that you can take the punch or that the other side will not be able to even send a punch. Right now we have a force that may appear peace-loving, may appear cautious, may appear restrained, and that force is U.S. diplomacy. And inadvertently, this force is midwifing and bolstering Iranian deterrence. What the Islamic Republic is counting on is that the threat of a wider regional war, the dangling of, while Putin is doing it, of the nuclear saber, or the rattling of the nuclear saber uh, in Europe, you have the rattling or the dangling of the conventional military weapon uh, in the Middle East today. And by dangling that and threatening the use of that, the U.S. is coming into the region as a more responsible and restrained actor. And for those of you who have paid attention to some of the comments from U.S. officials like Secretary of State Anthony Blinken or Secretary of, State, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Lloyd Austin or even from President Biden himself or potentially from some national security officials, that the U.S. is seeking at once in the heartland of the Middle East de-escalation but also seeking deterrence. These are two contradictory missions for U.S. policy and U.S. politics and represent a philosophical misunderstanding about how peace can actually be achieved uh, in this troubled part of the world. If one is de-escalating, they are doing so knowing that they need not bolster their deterrence. Conversely, if one is bolstering their deterrence to make it effective, you have to threaten and often engage in escalation. And the Islamic Republic is betting the Islamic Republic is hoping, and unfortunately, the Islamic Republic is benefiting from the U.S. prioritizing once that projectile is rattled, once that threat of the overt use of force is dangled, once the prospect of moving from the shadows and out into the public is spoken of and said, would jettison U.S. forces, diplomatic forces, rather than just military forces, into the heartland of the Middle East, and rather than be used to constrain and restrain and put the handcuffs on an American adversary, like the Islamic Republic of Iran, is instead designed to handcuff, handicap, and prevent the expansion and continuation of Israel's 10, 11 month war in Gaza. It's a very unique phenomenon where a newfound military capability plus the cognizance and the understanding of your adversaries risk aversion equals more conflict, equals more risk tolerance, and more, as we see with the Islamic Republic in the heartland of the Middle East, more overt missile activity. Now, certainly missiles have not been fired, I would say, yet, but we do have the case study of back in April. And even then, while that was a historic, overt, and first direct strike, 
between this state and Israel in their four plus decade shadow war. It's not the first ballistic missile use by Tehran during peacetime. I referenced the Iran-Iraq war in the beginning of our conversation today because that really is the incubating period, the time in which Tehran pursued the threats, the myriad threats that we face from it today. For those of you concerned about the nuclear program, you know, at the heyday of the revolution in 1979, uh, you could say the founding father of the Islamic revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini, said that the nuclear reactor should be turned into grain silos. But the onset of the war with Iraq, one year later, led the regime to reconsider those tools, those technologies, and the quest for the ultimate weapon of deterrence commenced in the 1980s. It was a direct line from the 1980s and Tehran's pursuit of deterrence then to its quest for a WMD capability and near threshold status today. In response also during that conflict to Saddam's Scud missile barrages, the Islamic Republic built ties and set out to talk to Hafez al-Assad Syria, Muammar al-Gaddafi's Libya, and the Kim family's North Korea to produce and procure a nascent ballistic missile arsenal that has, perhaps blossomed is not the right word, blossomed nonetheless, to become that largest ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East. And sometimes when you're looking at the threats of the Middle East, quantity has a quality of its own. We've seen that with that April attack where again 300 plus projectiles were fired. But the Islamic Republic in the past decade and a half has been moving from just quantity and its 3,000 plus ballistic missile arsenal to quality, range, precision, survivability, reliability, mobility. And while yes, based on US reports citing unnamed US officials during that April attack, half of Tehran's ballistic missiles failed, misfired, or did not go past the boost phase. This is not even talking about the successful intercepts of the US, Israel, and the other allied forces in the region, but failed due to technological defects of their own. While we in the West would say that's a poor standard, if you look at that from Tehran's perspective, and you look at the social media videos of the impact of some warheads in Israel, that's four to seven warheads, depending on the video, and depending on how you count. That could be four to seven too many if only one of those contained an unconventional payload lest we forget the former president of the Islamic Republic of Iran and someone who actually commanded forces during that formative conflict, uh, the late Ayatollah Rafsanjani, uh, who was uh, found dead in his house in 2017, uh, he famously said in the early 2000s that Israel was a one-bomb state. Uh, the Israelis rightly have repeated that line and used that line uh, when looking uh, at how to deter and contain and roll back the Iranian asymmetric threat because that is an area where they should rightly apply and have rightly applied the 0% doctrine of trying to prevent uh, the world's most dangerous regime from developing some of the world's most dangerous and destabilizing weapons. But within that rate of failure, within the Iranian perspective of that operation on April 14th, we could have a lesson learned that we may not want to have learned, where if they fired 100 missiles and 50% failed, maybe next time they might fire 200 or 300. And this is a rather precocious and prickly place for us all to be in today, to have to be waiting on Tehran to see what response they deign. And again, that willingness to use force is brought to you by those two other supplementary elements, technical capability and a political understanding of their adversary's desire for restraint and risk aversion rather than deterrence and risk tolerance. So unfortunately, this toxic combination is about to bring you more conflict in the Middle East, not less, particularly at a time when Tehran is using these weapons more frequently and more often and against a whole host of different targets, I might add. In March of this year, I published a piece with zero hidden knowledge, you know, there's a Persian Arabic word Il Mareb, hidden knowledge, it, it, it alludes to some kind of premonition, divine premonition. I had zero divine premonition that three weeks later the Islamic Republic would fire its biggest ballistic missile barrage in history. But looking at the past history of missile operations, really since 2017, believe it or not, Tehran has overtly and directly fired ballistic missiles from its own territory about 14 plus times, depending on how you count and depending on the target you consider and depending on what you consider a separate versus a combined arms operation. For instance, US forces in Iraq on January 2020 at two different bases 
received the largest ballistic missile barrage in U.S. history after the uh, world after World War II. The U.S. did not military respond. That was in response, obviously, to the killing of Qasem Soleimani, Iran's chief terrorist, by Donald Trump, former U.S. president, back earlier in January 2020. But nonetheless, the point still stands. In the minds of Iranian decision makers, an adversary that they styled the great Satan absorbed the Iranian missile attack. Fast forward a year and a half into September 2022, and for the first time ever, a U.S. citizen was killed with an Iranian ballistic missile when fired in the fall of 2022 uh, at Kurdish targets in northern Iraq. In the first four months of 2024, the Islamic Republic used ballistic missiles and fired them at two nuclear-armed nations, Pakistan and Israel. And it has, as far as we know now, no nuclear weapons, and it has survived to live to tell the tale. So again, this very toxic combination of an enhanced capability and a understanding of the irresolution of the adversary is leading to a lower threshold for the use of force and bringing a conflict that we've all known now, some call it the shadow war, some call it a proxy war, out of the shadows and into the open. I think it might be appropriate to end there and then begin the conversation. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Many thanks to our speakers. So we've got plenty of time for questions and discussion. I should have said at the start that thanks to the AJAC, the Australia, Israel and Jewish Affairs Council for making this talk possible tonight. We're very grateful. And so we come to um, questions and discussion. I'll put it back up. I'll, no, I'll leave it down and I'll put it back up. Um, to start off with, I mean, some recent reports. You, you've sp focused tonight on as you know, on Iran's ballistic missile capacity. There are some reports in the overseas media that Iran's defense force isn't doing much, isn't, isn't much good. Uh, now, that's a bit apart from missiles, one part of your defense force. But what about a general assessment of what Iran's military is like? What do we know about it? Or do we know anything about it? Uh, those forces are very much a force in transition. Yes, on paper. They don't even meet a passing grade of a 19, uh, 1960s or 1970s foreign trained army, uh, especially when you look at some of the Air Force assets that they have, older planes that then the US allied Shah had bought, like the F-4, the F-5, the F-14. These are really only still in use by one country, and that's the Islamic Republic of Iran. So in terms of the conventional forces, yes, they have atrophied. The same may apply for force structures as well. They have a large standing army, about 400,000 plus. That's the national army of Iran called the Artesh, founded in the early 1920s. But again, a lot of things have changed with the advent of the Islamic Revolution in 1979. And there was the creation of this force, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which very interestingly, the acronym IRGC, over which there was a robust debate here in Australia over the prescription of this entity in its entirety as a terrorist organization. I'd be happy to get a little bit further into that in the Q&A. Uh, but this force is about 125,000 strong and started really as a paramilitary and occupies not just the conventional forces and not just the irregular forces. And ours not merely a paramilitary, but they're a hybrid military force. They have everything from helicopters to drones to ballistic missiles. And their proficiency in some of these systems is leading them to be procured and diffused to other elements and other services of this larger standing army. Plus, increasingly, these are being found on the battlefields of the Middle East and around the world. So yes, Iranians are not necessarily uh, everywhere, but Iranian drones today can be found on four different continents. Uh, I remember back in 2020, for example, when the European Union opposed the expansion of UN penalties uh, against the Islamic Republic to create a worldwide arms embargo uh, on Tehran. Two years later, in the fall of 2022, uh, European Union, uh, Euro European citizens were targeted by those same drones which they failed to close the widening radius of. The Islamic Republic's arms industry is fostering again an evolution uh, in some of its forces. So again, while they may not meet our standards, they are increasingly auditioning for the, world, for the role of third world arms supplier, whether this is in Sudan or Ethiopia, uh, whether this is again uh, to supplement Russian forces for Putin's war against the Ukraine whether this is in South America, places like Venezuela, 
or even why eerily Amer copies of American drones that have been downed by Tehran a decade ago are finding themselves in the hands of Tehran's partner regime uh, in Pyongyang in North Korea. So long story short, again, the conventional forces pale in comparison, but the innovation and the fact that they're a hybrid warfighter means that we have to take their intention seriously, even though some of their capabilities on paper, again, would pale in comparison. I've got a question from, uh, stay where you are, from a Zoom question from Dmitry Bernstein. Um, the first bit's asking it would be a profit, but the second bit is not. So do you expect any conflict before the US election? transition? And secondly, what policy differences would you expect from a Harris as distinct from a Trump administration? Well, I think for the latter, we need some of that liquid courage that's outside this room. <laughs> and that may aid in the prophecy as well. Um, but I, f I forgot who said it, but prediction is difficult, especially about the past. And the reason I'm saying the past for the first question is that uh, for Mr. Dimitri, we are already in a conflict. That's the most important part to remember. Uh, the Islamic Republic opted in at every single opportunity uh, to widen this conflict, to again dangle the prospect of a wider multi-front, multi-region war such that Israel today faces six or seven different fronts of Iranian supplied weaponry. Again, perhaps not as well layered, but the integration of these fronts is what we're seeing before our eyes. So we are in a conflict, I would say that. Uh, so that checks the first question. And the second question, about a potential President Trump or a potential President Harris. Listen, I think it's quite clear that a potential President Trump, whatever one's views on US politics, would look to revert to some of the successes that he had in what the administration at the time called the maximum pressure policy, which was largely but not exclusively coercive economic measures, sanctions against the full spectrum uh, of the Iranian government, they got the Iranian economy, and then increasingly ratcheting them up over time uh, to make sure the regime was robbed of the revenues it needs to support its proxies, to support its drone program, to support the expansion of its missile program, you name it. And the Islamic Republic did not take this lying down, which meant that the administration had to evolve or ratchet up or push back on Iran's attempts to shake off this economic pressure. I think that's a highly likely return to course for a prospective Trump administration. Um, I will say, however, that on both the left and on the right, or particularly one should say on the far left and on the far right in American politics today, where it's much more of a circle than a line or a spectrum, uh, the forces of restraint and isolationism and withdrawing from the Middle East are ascendant forces. Uh, they're not majority forces, but they are ascendant forces. And the interesting thing is, whether you look at President Obama or President Biden, Trump or President Biden, they all have one different iterations of one similar message about the region, which is that the region is a junk bond and we have to pivot to Asia. Obama called it pivot to Asia. Trump called it great power competition. Uh, the Biden administration calls it a foreign policy for a middle class. But the message is the same. No more Middle East transformation, at best only transaction. And that is where we can pivot to what a potential Harris government may look like. This is not meant to be a partisan statement, but based on what candidate Harris has said and how actually she campaigned back in 2019 uh, for the presidency in 2020, she has the potential to be all things to all people. Areas where she has chosen to speak out about the Middle East thus far largely remain quarantined to the Israel-Gaza war. Uh, but that's not to say that the Democratic Party's dogma or desire to return to the JCPOA, the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, would not dominate uh, a potential Harris government's future Iran policy, which would mean that diplomacy rather than sanctions enforcement would be at the helm of what a prospective Harris government would do. Uh, and those are where the two paths really diverge over uh, the fate of a deal that no one is really adhering to in 2024 anyway. Thanks. Um, the, the key question that I sort of have in my mind all the time is the economy of Iran. Because as I understand it, it's not really in great shape and uh, therefore would be subject to you know, pretty severe sanctions from Israel if uh, they attacked. So have you any particular views or opinions on that front? Uh, for sure. The, the sanctioning power, really the sanctioning authority, would not be coming from Israel, but would be coming from the United States. And then whatever broader multilateral coalition would exist to give it political weight and legal weight. 
uh, what damage the Israelis might do to, to the Iranian economy would come from something kinetic. So perhaps what you saw with the Israelis in Yemen with the strike on the Hudeda port and going after some of the oil storage refineries and oil storage facilities there, uh, that might be replicated and that would have a catastrophic effect uh, on the regime's earnings, export potential, revenues that they might use uh, to fund its proxy wars and myriad other foreign engagements. Uh, but I do, I do have to, again, stress here that on solving the Iran issue, whatever one's views are on that, on the politics of Iran policy, whatever one's views are on that, to go back to the economic elements, because the regime's economy is indeed wobbly. It's wobbly on a good day. It's rife with mismanagement. Um, this regime has sacrificed the altar of the Iranian, uh, sacrificed everything, uh, including the Iranian national interest and the Iranian public good on the altar of regime survival and the maintaining of this Islamist authoritarian elite, which has not a national mission, but a transnational mission. And in this world, those revenues go not to the Iranian people, but they go to a lot of these missions that we've talked about today. And in not ending or terminating those missions, but rather handicapping them or imposing greater costs on them, the Trump administration's maximum pressure policy, if you look at the macroeconomic terms, created about a decade's worth of multilateral sanctions pain and about a year and a half unilaterally. So whatever one's views are on that, the numbers speak for themselves. And that was without firing a single shot. Yeah, we given a question. Did Iran fire missiles into Pakistan in the 2020s and why? Uh, yes, Iran fired uh, ballistic missiles, we believe, uh, into Pakistan in very early this year, in 2024. Uh, they said it was targeting uh, Baluch terrorists or separatists. The Baluch people occupy the southwest part uh, of Iran, the uh, southeast part of Iran, and the southwest part of Pakistan. So they straddle both sides of the border. Both the Pakistani central government and the Iranian central government uh, have qualms and have actually repressed uh, this ethnic community uh, historically uh, and in the present as well. Uh, the Iranians fired allegedly at, at what they allege were terrorist camps, facilities of the Baluch on the Pakistani side. The Pakistanis actually kinetically responded very quickly and fired at the Baluch population on the Iranian side, claiming that they were secessionists, separatists, what have you. Um, while some would look at this as a case study in deterrence, because the Pakistanis fired the missiles and then quickly, much like the kennedy Khrushchev exchange, offered a de-escalation path via uh, political communique. Uh, I think the issue is a bit more complex and it may not be the best study of deterrence. And the reason is that which both sides struck, even though it was a fundamental puncturing of sovereignty and a major loss of face for both central authorities, these two countries would not have rushed up the escalation ladder because that which was struck in terms of the balance of interest was comparatively of little value. So the costs of going up the escalation ladder for both central authorities, because the Baluch were struck on both sides of the border, uh, did, did not warrant it, or they did not believe that the defense of these populations warranted running up the escalation ladder. So that, in my view, played a great role in dampening the conflict as well. I know that uh, Iran is both Shia and Persian, whereas most of the other significant powers are Sunni and Arab. But can you explain why Iran seems, amongst all those powers in North Africa and the Middle East, to have this unique hatred for Israel, which it doesn't even have a disputed border with? And does the Iranian population support the regime's hatred? It's actually an excellent question, one very near and dear to my heart as an Iranian-American, but also one that you need not take from me, but you should take from the brave and protesting Iranians who really since 2009, uh, in different iterations of street protests since then, but particularly since 2017, but these slogans go back to 2009, they tell you where they stand, which is not Gaza, not Lebanon, my life only for Iran. It's a rhyming slogan in Persian they've been chanting, na Gaza, na Lebanon, jonam fadai Iran. So it's a fundamentally nationalist critique of the central government's fundamentally Islamist perspective on things. Again, the, the difference is the particular for the Iranian population versus the general or universal for the views, values, and interests of the Islamic regime in Tehran. And it is, a, it is not just a center periphery thing, it is a population versus regime elites divide, and it's a state versus society divide that continues to bubble up. For example, 
uh, in early 2020, in January 2020, when the Iranians shot a uh, Ukrainian passenger jet out of the sky, killing over 100 innocent civilians. This was shortly after uh, the military exchange where they fired on those two U.S. bases. Uh, they had painted outside of a university an American flag and an Israeli flag uh, in Tehran to get the students and the passersby and onlookers to trample on it on the pavement. Uh, you can again find the videos for yourself, but you have vast queues of Iranians going around the border of the flag and hissing and even assaulting those who would transgress and walk upon it. So, you know, the Middle East today is a rather complex place. And again, I wouldn't just say this as an Iranian American, but Fundamentally, there aren't that many places to do statecraft and soulcraft at the same time. There aren't that many places to hang your head and your heart at the same time. There aren't that many places to do strategy or to do well by your strategy for the West and to do well by your values for the West uh, outside of, I would say, uh, standing with Israel and supporting the Iranian people. So this is a regime elite that cut their teeth on opposing Israel, opposing America, and opposing the Shah. And so fundamentally, these guys who came into power have co-opted all the tools of statecraft to carry out this ideational mission, which, as you mentioned, is not demographic, is not geographic, and as the Iranian population said, has no dividend and is devoid of strategy. Thank you. Um, if the Islamic Republic as a regime is that fragile and doesn't have the support of the community as you've described. Why is it that the Americans, having been the recipients of missiles from Iran and the Israelis indeed, why haven't they engaged in activities to encourage or support regime change? You know, this actually is a, also a fascinating question and, and a study more about us in the West and the threats and the opportunities that exist in the Middle East, particularly for America. Uh, you know, you can you can kind of cordon out Israel here because historically they don't do social engineering in the Middle East. It's a whole series of limited engagements with their adversaries. But what the U.S. has done and what the hangover, you could say, that the U.S. suffers from in the region is essentially the Iraq and Afghanistan war syndrome, the hangovers associated with the track record of, I wouldn't even just say a long war, but a track record where the average American hasn't felt the benefit was worth the cost. And I don't think that's a partisan or a political statement to say. It's more of an indictment of political and military elites than the nation which voted, or perhaps most importantly, of those soldiers who made those brave sacrifices. Grafting that, however, onto the Iran challenge is a little odd because, A, I don't think many of the people who are calling for standing with the Iranian people are calling for anything at all, uh, like what happened in 2002, 2003 Iraq, or 2001 Afghanistan. The great irony is these were foreign imposed political projects to induce change, but I think Iran is home to the second oldest constitutional movement in Asia. I think the first was following the uh, Meiji reforms in Japan uh, in the late uh, 1900s, if I'm not in the late 19th century, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the constitutional movement, the constitutional revolution in Iran goes back to 1905, 1906. So this is a population for which for over a century has been seeking representative government and a government that would put the public good above all other things. Unfortunately, they haven't had that. And it's eerie to now transpose strategy and national security and statecraft onto this conflict in the Middle East because whenever a adversarial government is in peril, you know who bails them out, their authoritarian partners. The Assad regime in Syria is a good example. Putin came to his aid, the Islamic Republic of Iran came to his aid. But the great peril here is who comes to the aid of the liberals and the moderates uh, in the heartland of the Middle East who do go out onto the street time and time and time again, especially if you look at the boom and bust cycles of protests since 2017, especially that which escalated into the women life freedom movement, the Zanzen de Gyozadi movement of 2022-2023, where these weren't protests done by people in Tehran with genes cooler than you and I. These were outside in uh, demographically and geographically diverse protests that touched 150 different cities, towns, and even villages. And the inability of Washington to develop a policy of maximum support for the Iranian people or implement uh, strategies that thus far other organizations, including like my own, have put forth for maximum support for the Iranian people is, I would say, a gross oversight and a needless handicapping and handcuffing of some of the things that the U.S. does well, which is to stand up for its own values and to do well by its own strategy. Imagine the post-October 7 Middle East without the head of the octopus guiding these multi-front wars. And just, you don't even have to take the Israeli perspective on it, look at the US. 
in the Iraqi, Syrian, and even Jordanian theater, places where the U.S. has bases, since October 7th, via proxies of the Islamic Republic, there have been, I think, about 174 or 175 attacks on U.S. positions since October 7th. The U.S. has only militarily responded to 11. How are we to do well by others when we haven't done well by ourselves? So does that mean that a re regime change couldn't, can't come from within, or...? I think it, it is coming from within. I mean, the, the vast chasm that exists between state and society. I mean, as we know, the 1979 revolution was a popular revolution, but within less than a generation, and as soon as you had that popular revolution, you had popular and street resentment against that revolution. The erosion of women's rights, then the erosion of the social and economic freedoms of that period, and then ultimately a whole cascade of political projects to reform the system. Those failed, and you've had continuous attempts by brave Iranians to try to change the system. The irony is those who are brave in taking bullets on the streets of Tehran and elsewhere are not met with requisite bravery uh, in the halls of power in the West to even use the word regime change. I mean, if one uses the word regime change in the city that I live and work in, in Washington, D.C., you're castigated as some eerie Iraq War 2.0 warmonger, uh, when in reality uh, this is a fundamentally different kind of project. So, no, the change is coming from within. I think the more imperative change is for the change to be made from without, to be able to marry uh, the diaspora and the domestic, to be able to marry the foreign and the domestic. And so long as we fail to do that, I think the next generation of the best and brightest will also be gunned down. It was widely reported that Iran pushed for the um, Hamas um, attack to forestall the Saudi Israel uh, Abraham Accord Alliance. Given that Saudi Arabia has had, I guess, closer relationships with Iran over the last year or so, facilitated by China. What do you see that relationship being as soon as the Gaza war ends and the Abraham Accords are signed with Saudi? It's a great question and, and one of the undistributed middles of that question is what is the role of Iranian diplomacy in all of this? And there I would say their regional strategy, particularly if you look at what they've been trying to do with some American <coughs> partners in the region. Saudi Arabia, Bahrain potentially in the future, Azerbaijan currently, Egypt and Morocco in the more recent past, is they're trying to rope-a-dope this constellation of pro-status quo, pro-American forces, after having for a decade or so put a knife in the back uh, of many of these states. I mean, the model essentially is a knife in the back, a handshake in the front, and that's designed to, on balance, foster fear, which on balance will foster not these countries becoming into an Islamic Republic 2.0 tomorrow, but it is designed to get the decision makers in these capitals to, on balance, accommodate rising Islamic Republic power. So uh, in this sense, uh, we have seen a fair amount of dovishness, one can say, from both Saudi Arabia and the UAE, particularly as, at least for the Saudi side, when the Red Sea is set ablaze and they have a massive Red Sea border, there is no desire to go back because of the bad experience of the war with the Houthis uh, in Yemen to the south. And what the Saudis will actually dangle or push back on for any kind of potential uh, Western desire to get the Saudis to be part of this maritime coalition uh, is to say, well, since October 7th, uh, we have not been fired on once, so the strategy of accommodation pays. And that's, that's the eerie part. That's what the Islamic Republic wants to re get you to be able to do, which is to pay to play, to get you to pay to be a supplicant. And it only comes again after a long period of time of the knife in the back and the handshake in the front, but that is largely where we are headed. It does not mean that in these capitals there is some newfound love. In fact, the Saudis know exactly what the regime is up to. The Saudis, in my view, would still, still, despite some of the political costs that would be imposed on a post-October 7 Middle East, still be seeking an Abraham Accords 2.0 via the U.S., via Israel. I think a lot of that stuff is still on track, but what the Islamic Republic was trying to do is to increase the transaction costs and to delay that. And again, you don't have to take it from me, take it from the Supreme Leader of Iran. I think his last speech 
before October 7th was on October 3rd. And he talked about the countries that were at that time attempting to normalize relations with Israel. Uh, and he gave a, a horse racing analogy and he said they're, they're akin to betting on a losing horse. A couple months later, as it looked like the Saudis were still potentially, based on leaks and reports, uh, interested in some kind of normalization agreement uh, with the Israelis, again, via an American mediator, uh, the Supreme Leader of Iran took to the podium again and he said, uh, trying to get the translation properly down in my head, mm -hmm. uh, he said that these nations that are still interested in normalizing relations with Israel should fear their own populations. And this kind of rhetoric uh, has roots. Uh, for example, less than two weeks after the Iranians covertly, but directly, attacked via drones and cruise missiles major Saudi oil fields in, the, in September of 2019, uh, Iran's then President Hassan Rouhani, largely styled as a moderate, went to the UNGA in New York City. And within his otherwise full text of Persian speech, he ad-libbed an Arabic proverb. And the Arabic proverb he ad-libbed is, first the neighbor, then the house. Basically saying, if you want to worry about your house, first accommodate, secure your neighbor. And this is the same philosophy, the knife and the handshake. And it's designed to keep Israel out of the region and get the U.S. to leave the region. So that on balance, the region accommodates this rising power. Could I ask you to talk uh, to your point on the IRGC, but also from an Australian policy perspective, what would leadership look like? You know, leadership, this is no, no disrespect to our friends in Ottawa, but leadership may not always look like copying the Canadians, but here it certainly does mean copying the Canadians. The Canadians, after a rancorous 12-year debate across multiple parties, across different iterations of sessions of parliament, uh, have actually prescribed the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in its entirety uh, as a terrorist organization using their domestic counterterrorism authorities. This is the second country in the entire Five Eyes apparatus, with the U.S. being the first incrementally in 2017 and then more fully in 2019 to prescribe or designate this terrorist group in its entirety as a terrorist group and apply those full range of legal penalties. So leadership means you know, making sure this Five Eyes alliance, this intelligence sharing alliance, in this decade of the 2020s, and forgive the pun or the jargon, sees 2020 in the 2020s. We cannot be sharing such detailed and robustly layered and classified and compartmentalized intelligence, but not apply them towards the same end, to have different definitions of who is a terrorist versus who is not a terrorist. And this I don't want to use the word cop-out, cop out, but this carve-out that I hear time and again from friendly jurisdictions, and not just in Australia, but across the European Union, uh, what we heard for many years in Canada, God, God, God bless them, they did a U-turn, and even in the United Kingdom. And then historically, even in New Zealand, given the smaller protesting population there as well, and given the fact that New Zealand has actually improved its record on human rights sanctions against the Islamic Republic, given this track record that we laid out. Um, so it, it does mean making a tough call. And the fact that all these jurisdictions are saying, well, we can't go after the element of a sovereign government, ignores the fact that they have in the past. For example, the European Union in 2019 uh, designated two subdivisions of Iran's Ministry of Intelligence. That's not even an element of an army. That's the element of an actual ministry after a terrorist plot was foiled. So there is a track record to every legal problem. There is a legal solution. And this is not just being good on a national security issue far, far away from Australia. In all of these jurisdictions, particularly Commonwealth jurisdictions that have these domestic counterterrorism authorities, this is about securing Australian citizens and securing the safety of Australians and preventing the long arm of the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism on this soil. This is a tool of domestic law enforcement that can weaponize the law enforcement apparatus to prevent something to having to go to and becoming a national security challenge on your own soil. Perhaps following on from a previous question, where does Saudi Arabia and Egypt stand in all this? Yeah, can, are there any scenarios whereby 
either or both might take even direct action against Iran. I wouldn't be able to comment on Egypt, but I would say that's unlikely because the general approach of the Sisi government has been status quo everywhere. Uh, in terms of the rehabilitation of the Assad regime uh, before the League of Arab States did it, it seemed to me that the Egyptian position was just lock in everything where it is. You know, the Egyptians had enough to deal with on the domestic front. They were not interested in increasing tensions against any recognized or potentially recognizable government in any jurisdiction. And I think that's largely uh, been the case. Uh, we can discuss <laughs> Egypt, Israel, and Egypt, Hamas uh, at another time, but then that leaves Saudi Arabia. Um, I think the answer is no. I mean, largely the Saudis have benefited from this American security umbrella. They've been trained for sure uh, for many years by U.S. forces. But the goal, I think, is not to have to have Saudi Arabia, at least in their mind, begin an overt hot war. I think the Saudis rightly understand that there is a large, soft underbelly that many of these projectiles could hit. I mean, I think if I had to put a economic and a political rationale towards otherwise this hedging strategy that the Saudis have, this pay-to-play strategy, is to say that uh, the king, and in general, uh, the crown prince, and in general, the Saudi establishment, the Saudi ruling family, the Saudi monarchy, uh, for years had a relationship and has a relationship based on energy for security. You know, this is the mainstream reading of U.S.-Saudi relations. You provide energy, we provide security. But as the energy flows have changed from the west to the east in the past two decades, and as in the perception of this Saudi elite, in my view, uh, the U.S. security commitment has been less than forthcoming, meaning in the attempt to deal with the rising Iranian threat, you have the U.S. actually revert to diplomacy and do in secret the JCPOA nuclear deal. The Saudis feel slighted. Then they encourage regional solutions to regional problems, and the Saudis go into Yemen, and the U.S. doesn't like the way that looks. And then they begin to put political pressure and curtail that. Then a whole series of other crises to include the Khashoggi crisis introduce major transaction costs with real ramifications for uh, U.S.-Saudi relations and U.S.-Saudi security, such that the Saudis may say, this may not be worth it. Let's not pay to play. Let's pay to delay and at least be able to accomplish that which we want to on the home front. This domestic revolution, this economic blossoming, this political opening by relative comparative standards in Riyadh, uh, let's not have that be under the Iranian nuclear umbrella, or God forbid if it is, let's, have not, let's not have that target be on our backs. So I think for the short to medium term, the Saudis are looking to delay. And I think unfortunately the Iranians understand that. Uh, the real question is where are the Americans in all of this? Question down there, we're getting close to the end, so yes. Hi. Um, could you please speak to the influence of the Iranians um, to the universities in mainly America and also Australia, England, um, et cetera, and why the governments of these places are reluctant to try and curb it all? I can't speak exactly to a direct link, but I can, I can give you this, which is outside of the Middle East today where you have the preference for militarism by the regime to accomplish its goals. In these other jurisdictions, whether you get as close to the region in the Middle East, like South Asia, or a touch farther away, like Sub-Saharan Africa, or even a touch farther away, like Europe, or a touch farther away, like Australia, or a touch farther away, like South America, what the regime is doing to further its perception of its interest is not the immediate militarist version like you see with the Shia militias running amok in the heartland of the Middle East and firing missiles. It is the attempt to co-opt. It is the attempt to get control through co-option of another generation, not just via the universities, but also via preying on the downtrodden and dispossessed in many of these places. For example, in South America, what they do is they prey on the indigenous population. They still have a revisionist, Khomeinist, you know, radical interpretation of their version of the 12 or Shiite Islam that they're promoting, but they'll do it backstopped by embassies and consulates, but then mosques and cultural centers, and then different institutes that may have financial inroads with some universities. I'm unfamiliar with some of the university financing off the top of my <coughs> head, but they may be following and trotting in a well-established playbook of some uh, frenemy type nations like Qatar that have a robust uh, kind of uh, investment. So this is a place where their soft power begins, but is not designed to remain soft in the medium to long term. Uh, they have what they call the government of God back in Tehran. 
they are now trying to create subsidiaries of that government, of the society, of their perception of God uh, abroad. And it's part of their larger policy of what they have called for the past four decades, uh, the export of the revolution. And in some theaters of conflict, that's an armed export. And in some others, it's an ideological designed to co-opt another generation, to, to nullify another generation. I'm going to zoom this one in. It sort of goes back to an earlier question you took. Sorry, actually. I've got a zoom question. I've got a zoom question here, which goes back to an earlier question that you, you took. And the question is that decades ago, the focus really was on a conflict as we looked at Islam between Sunni and Shia, but with Iran doing all this leading, does that mean much anymore? It's a kaleidoscopic question because the facts are the facts, but how you rearrange them gives you a different answer. You know, you could look at the 1980 Iran-Iraq war and say this was a period of the uh, cementing of nationalism, where Iraqi Shia uh, and even Iranian Arabs remain confined to their national border-drawn boundaries. But the 2003 Iraq war, you fast forward several decades, and this transnational sectarian element became a huge element of Iranian foreign and security policy and actually carried great weight and resonance beyond its borders. Because of, I think, the first question that we had today, which was about uh, or the second question, which was about the Persian Shiite versus the Arab Sunni, those are still fault lines in the region. But the way the regime, at least again, to that soft power, to that export of the revolution, the way they get over it is through this ecumenical approach to co-opting anti-status quo forces. It's through that prism that, you know, Persian Shiite Iran, or more importantly, just Shiite Islamic Republic, is able to build bonds of affection and affinity and material support for terror with a Sunni group like Hamas. And you can look at the timeline and see how the relationship is scaled up between the first Intifada and the Madrid conference, then looking to find the group that would be an armed group that could put a shiv literally in the Oslo process and then scale up that material support over time such that even when there is a conflict introduced, an ideological conflict between patron and proxy, because if you remember, uh, Iran has only one state partner in the Middle East, and that's the Assad regime. And the Assad regime is Alawite, so at best heterodox Shia, not even that. Uh, but Hamas thumbed its nose uh, at this group. It used to be headquarters in Doha now. It used to be headquartered in Damascus. They went from Damascus to Doha under the auspices of the Arab Spring. Hamas was trying to gain that still, that, that, that kind of Arab, pan-Arab Islamist favor. And Unlike some other alliances, rather than the Islamic Republic turn its back on this investment, it said, wait, it said, wait. And someone who was essential in repairing this relationship and making sure the bonds that would tie would be ecumenical, and that so long as the baseline was anti-Semitism and anti-Americanism, those bonds would endure, uh, Ismail Haniyeh actually played a key role in the rehabilitation of Hamas uh, in Iran's axis of resistance. So depending on the time, the answer may vary. Depending on the group, the answer may vary. Uh, but the regime is able to walk and chew gum between ecumenicalism and sectarianism, between the ideological export of its revolution and the militarized export of its revolution. And that's precisely what makes it so lethal. It's this morphing, shape-shifting uh, element. And a very quick question. Uh, you, you warned us about making predictions about the past. and. Whatever, it's probably more dangerous than making them about the future. Um, if you came back here in a year's time for your fourth appearance at the Sydney Institute, do you think the situation would have changed very much? I will say yes to that, uh, <laughs> uh, to that invitation. Thank you very much. But um, I fear it'll, it is going to get worse, not better. I think this is a former president uh, of Israel, Shimon Peres, comment, uh, where he said there is light at the end of the tunnel, uh, but there is no tunnel. I think as he said, there's good news, there's light at the end of the tunnel, there's bad news, there's no tunnel. Uh, so yeah, the forces that should be ascendant domestically in Iran, the population, that desire, that bravery continues. The will of Israel, of Israelis to exist, to continue to do what they can to defend themselves, that exists. How we get those forces to be more interactive and interoperable in this rough political climate, I don't know. Um, but there's no way out but through. So hopefully we can go through together in a year. Thanks. Thank you.